And we appreciate the extension agents who have hopped on as well as the clientele that have hopped on to discuss a topic that we've uh, unfortunately having to, having to deal with in the Upper Cumberland. And I know a lot of you in other parts of the state have, have been dealing with it for several weeks, but we appreciate Dr. Scott Stewart, who is the director of the West Tennessee Research and Education Center for hopping on with us, along with Dr. Frank Hale, who is our entomologist housed in Nashville, who, who focuses more on entomology in homeowner type settings. And uh, both these gentlemen are highly qualified to talk about this subject of army worms. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you fellas. And again, our thanks for hopping on on short notice. We appreciate you guys. Well, thanks, actually. I think this is a, probably a good idea that maybe I should have done two, three weeks ago. I'm not sure there would have been quite as wide an interest at the time, uh, you know, now that it's spread throughout the state, it's gotten on everybody's radar. But Frank and I did a little note sharing before and, and uh, kind of said, well, I'll kick it off. And I did put a little prep in here. I'm going to share a screen, screen and go through a little bit of basics of fall armyworm. Uh, but I want this to be real informal. So anybody that... Uh, you know, has a question, just shout it in or, or, or chat it in, and I'll try to keep up uh, with it. Uh, let's see if it'll let me do it. Here we go. So I'm hoping everybody's seeing that. Yeah. All right. All right. Good deal. So just uh, real basic stuff. We're talking about the fall armyworm and I put the scientific name up there because there's a lot of different kinds of armyworms that are out there, uh, including the true armyworm. And, and uh, uh, this one's Spidoptera frugiperta. And you know, they call it fall armyworm for a reason because in most of the United States and definitely in our geography, it tends to be a, a, a fall pest. Uh, we deal with it at some level every year. Uh, just a little bit about the biology of it is it it is not able to go through a dipause stage. It doesn't have a dipausing larval stage, adult stage, pupil stage. And what that means is it can't survive a hard freeze. Once its hosts are gone or once it gets cold enough to, to kill it, it it's going to die. And so really it reinfests uh, Tennessee every year and it takes it a while to get here. Uh, the true armyworm is a native species. That's the one we get often, some well, often in the springtime in our wheat and sometimes in pastures. It's it's not a spidoptera, even though it's it's an armyworm. It's it's got a different uh, genus name, uh, but it's pretty diagnostic. If you get armyworms in the spring, people are often talking about true armyworm, whereas in the fall, it, it's very often fall armyworm that's getting in our pastures and and other things, as we all know. Uh, this just pictures of the male on the left and, and the female on the right. They're really just kind of ordinary brown moths. Uh, the female is even more ordinary than the male. Uh, entomology, a lot of times we call these DBMs. It stings for dang brown moths because they're hard to identify unless you know them pretty well. But, you know, they go through a real um, typical life cycle. They have an egg stage. And I'll show you pictures of their egg mass. Uh, it's a big egg mass that they lay, one 200 larvae in an egg mass. It takes several days for that to hatch, depending on temperature. And then it's going to go through five larval instars, uh, the caterpillars. And with a lot of caterpillars, and they're no exception, uh, you can easily miss them during those first two or three instars. But uh, when they hit that fourth or fifth instar, they, can, they do about 90% of their feeding. And, and the damage can really accumulate quickly. The pupil stage is just a brown thing that you won't see because it occurs underground. I actually have seen a few of them when they emerge. That adult will sometimes drag that pupil, brown pupil case above the ground, and I've seen them on our lawns here. And then you're back to the moth. That whole thing takes probably about 25 days. They tend, tend to take about 12, 13 days in that larval stage, and then about another 10 days in that pupil stage. And, and so the whole process in the summer, warm summertime, maybe 25 days or so. I, I mentioned they don't uh, overwinter here. Uh, I got a heads up back in late June from my colleague at Texas A&M that said, hey, these things are bad this year and they're unusually early. Uh, so heads up. And I kind of watched them progress as they came from Texas. And they probably started in areas of Texas that didn't freeze or Mexico. And they've, they've migrated their, their way northward. Uh, you know, having several generations while they did that through Louisiana, through Arkansas, through 
Mississippi and, and, you know, made it up here unusually early. We really started seeing them in West Tennessee towards the beginning of August, uh, mid, uh, mid August in particular. Uh, I, I don't want to talk a lot about the biology other than that, but I got to mention that they, they're kind of unique. They have two different strains. Uh, one's called the grass strain or sometimes the rice strain. And that's the one we're likely dealing with. And it's the one that also gets in the Bermuda grass and, and, and it's really kind of a grass loving strain. And there's another one they call often the cotton strain. And it, it's pretty interesting. The one that tends to get in cotton, even though it's the same species, doesn't seem to like the grasses and, and vice versa. Uh, there is some overlap, and my, my guess is they're kind of on the way to becoming different species, and they haven't quite become different species yet, and that's why they call them strains. But those strains have some different behaviors. They also have different tolerances to insecticides. Usually this rice or grass strain is easier to control. This year has been a bit of an exception. Uh, the one in the cotton uh, and, and some other crops tends to be more difficult to control. All right, so real quickly, that's just an egg mass uh, that's hatching out, and that's a pretty big egg mass. That's probably, you know, 200 uh, plus larvae sitting there, and when you have a lot of these egg masses out there, uh, things can happen pretty dang quickly. Uh, the, the egg mass itself is covered with scales from the moths. Uh, you're not going to see it unless you're looking very closely. Uh, very often, what I've seen in the lawns this year, and you'll see it, is when they hatch, you'll see this kind of spreading uh, infestation. You'll have a brown spot that kind of grows and grows, and of course the larvae are growing as well, and if you've got a bunch of these egg masses in your lawn or in your pasture, they're eventually going to coalesce into, into one, one big infestation. So these are more uh, full-grown larvae here. I took these pictures not long ago in our, in our grounds at the station. Uh, you know, the, the grass strain, the one that we call the rice strain, is a little bit different. If you've had any kind of introductory entomology course, a lot of times they describe the fall armyworm of, of, as having a dark body and a dark head capsule with a, uh, that pronounced kind of inverted Y on the head. And you can see that inverted Y is pretty pronounced, but a lot of times this grass phase is a lot lighter green in coloration and the head can be quite a bit lighter in color. And you can see over on the picture on the right that they're pretty variable. I could show you a lot of pictures where they're a lot lighter colored than that, but I just wanted to make that point. Another characteristic you'll talk, they'll talk about is these kind of four dominoes on its, its tail section. But pretty diagnostic is you have a, a large infestation of caterpillars in the fall of the year in certain grasses, it's more than likely going to be this fall armyworm. Just, just some more pictures. Uh, Again, you can see the color variation in that white head capsule. I just want to go ahead and play this video because I thought it was cool. They are cannibalistic, especially when you get a lot of them. Uh, this is a video I took uh, last week. Uh, one's munching down on another one. And you better be careful because this one looks like he's lining him up in his sights. And... Just some more pictures to make a, make a couple of points. And, and one of the points I wanna make is they, they eat a lot of different things, but they do have their preferences. This picture on the left is, is behind our garden areas here in Jackson, if you've been here. Most of this is Bermuda here, and most of it's been munched on pretty good by fall armyworms, this area in particular. And really the reason this is green is because it's primarily switching over to zoysia. And then they don't really like zoysia, and there's some other grasses out here they, they won't necessarily eat. One of their favorites is Bermuda grass, whether it's a pasture, whether it's a lawn. Uh, they like sorghum, sweet sorghum, sorghum sedan grass. Uh, you know, we have a surprising number of people that grow Johnson grass or crabgrass uh, for forage, and they seem to eat that just fine. Uh, you know, they like millet, so I've always gotten calls in the fall of the year about people having fall armyworms in their duck holes. You got to watch your millet. Somebody jumps out there and plants some wheat or oats or, oats or something like that too early for their deer plots. Fall armyworms love to get on it. I've already mentioned rice, they'll so get in corn. So you can see they're not real picky. Uh, they do get in alfalfa. In fact, the Midwest is starting to run into problems with them now. They'll get in soybean. We had a pretty big issue a couple of weeks ago in late planted soybean. 
in my experience, what's happening there a lot of times is they're actually getting on the grasses, the crab grasses or the volunteer wheat that might be in some double crop soybean and they get a start and then they move to the soybean and I'll show you some pictures. It can be, be pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, uh, cotton, uh, yeah, they'll get in cotton, they'll get in, in field corn in the ears, but typically that's gonna be that, that cotton strain rather than this grass strain. It's, it's really pretty interesting. I've got cotton immediately next to these uh, heavily infested grasses and there's, there's hardly any fall armyworms in them. Uh, I, I wanna get some input as we go along here uh, when I open this up, but you know what we're seeing in orchard grass and some of the other grasses that I, uh, like fescue that I spend a little less, uh, less time in, I think it will be something I can learn from you all. But, but just some examples, uh, you know, this is a sprayed area of our gardens, uh, taken at the same time this over here in the right was not sprayed. And, and you can see what they're doing to the Bermuda grass in this lawn. It's not going to kill it. Bermuda grass, if it's well established, is, is, is going to recover. Uh, you know, it may continue to get damaged because you can have several, several generations, but it's not going to look very, very pretty, at least for a little while. Rains will help it recover. Uh, so one thing I always tell people, if they're tired of mowing, just let them eat. And uh, that's an alternative. Uh, and it certainly is. Uh, just showing you some example. These are pictures sent to me, texted to me earlier this year. This was millet. I mentioned millet. That's about a three-day difference, guys. In fact, it was exactly a three-day difference. So, you know, obviously in that picture on the left, they had a bunch of small larvae in there. He didn't know it at the time. And you, you, you walk away and three days later, there's those small larvae are pretty big larvae and, and they can really wear it out. I, I mentioned the grassy soybeans. Uh, this is an example and you'll see what happened in this case. This is a bunch of, of grasses growing up in these uh, late planted soybeans and there's fall armyworms all over them. You're starting to see some feeding on the soybean in there. Uh, this is that same field just a few days later. Uh, so when populations are high, things can happen pretty quickly. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite pictures and it's not from this year, it's from back in that, I think 2014 year we were talking about that was so bad. Uh, this is a early mid August picture from a 50 acre soybean field and the only soybeans left in the field uh, is this little patch here. And that's actually where he spilled a bunch of seed loading the planter. So it was ultra thick in there. And really pretty impressive. And you can see how tall those beans were. What's really interesting about this story is this grower sprayed this field with Roundup on a Monday and didn't notice a problem. And this picture was taken either Thursday or Thursday or Friday. I don't remember which now. So again, things can happen pretty quickly. I did want to talk a little bit about some of the pesticide uh, things we need to know about. Uh, I think a lot of us entomologists assume probably more than we should about what's a general use and what's an restricted use and what people really understand that to be. I just pulled this screenshot off a, a Texas uh, Department of Texas uh, website just because I thought it was a good definition. So you have general use class of uh, pesticides and restricted use pesticides or RUPs. And you've seen some emails about this. So if something's federally restricted, that means it, it, you can't buy it or apply it without being a certified applicator. And, I, and you all know that. Uh, general use or non-restricted use is probably the better terminology. It can be used by the general public. We actually have a lot of, of pesticides that are used in agriculture, but they, they, they're they still general use because they're relatively safe. And, and you can look that up, but I, I just want to make sure people were clear on that because some of these uh, pesticides we use very often in our field crops, people just assume they're restricted use, uh, but in real, reality, they're not. A lot of these things we recommend on pasture are not restricted use, and I'll, I'll mention some of that in a minute. Uh, there's a website right here that if you wanted to just Google this, there's an EPA website and it's a very comprehensive website. I'm gonna tell you, this is, there's, there's literally thousands of insecticides that uh, lit on this website. You can go on it and search and see if the insecticide you're using is restricted use or not. And if it's restricted use, of course, you have to be certified. Uh, what I do, and I could probably do this live, but I use a website called Agrian. Uh, I think y'all need to bookmark this website if, 
if you're not using it all the time. I already just had a question about this about uh, 30 minutes ago, but you just get this Agrian website, you go in there, you search for the trade name. In this case, I'm using, I'm searching for a product called Banticore, which is labeled for pastures. And when you pull that up, this is the screen. When you get your search, it's going to show you whether it's federally restricted or not. And if you go to this website and click on this documents, that's where you're going to find your labels. And that's where the question came from a few minutes ago, is you'll find a label for Banticore, but very often there's going to be additional labels that are called two double E labels. And in the case of Prevathon, for example, the question was, I don't see where you can use a rate lower than 14 ounces of Prevathon on pasture. But if you looked at a two double E label, you'll find that there actually is one. Uh, so they're wondering where I came up with that rate. Very useful website. It's pretty up to date and, and easy to find. Now, of course, we got a lot of other resources. I always try to plug our utcrops.com website. We have the news blog website. Uh, we have our guide website, which uh, would have information about soybean, for example. I was just putting a plug in there. It's kind of one-stop shop. And if you remember utcrops.com, you can get links to all these websites across the top and, and more. We'll skip over that uh, real quick, but I did want to take a minute to talk specifically about the insecticides that can be used on fall armyworm and that are commonly recommended. And I'll mention on these which ones are considered general use or restricted use. Dr. Hale is probably going to talk more about the stuff that homeowners would use, but a lot of the comments I'm going to be made are going to be related to pasture or to field crops themselves. Uh, there's a, there's overlap in those those same active ingredients. So when we classify the common active ingredients that are used, I'll mention first the pyrethroids, and I think everybody's familiar with the pyrethroid insecticides. Normally they do quite well on the grass strain of this fall armyworm. Uh, this year they've been all over the board to not working well at all to being pretty good depending on who you ask. And that's, that's what's kind of been unique about this fall armyworm outbreak this year. It's not only the sheer size of it, but the, the fact that the pyrethroids have not worked as well. I'm going to guess that both of those are related. But there's a bunch of different examples. Pyrethrum is a natural, organic, plant-derived pyrethroid. All the other ones are synthetic. Uh, permethrin, bifenthrin, cyhalothrin, cyfluthrin, cypermethrin. Most of them end in that thrin. Almost all of these, with the exception of the pyrethroid, pyrethrum and some formulations of the permethrin. In the agricultural world, if you were using Brigade or Warrior or Baythroid, they would be restricted use. However, you can get formulations of these uh, homeowners can that are general use because they're much more diluted. The other one we use a lot are the dimide chemistries. Really the only one that I, I'm familiar with is is the chloran tranilipriol, that's your Prevathon, your Banticor, uh, Elevist, and the Siege have that same active and they're mixed with one of the pyrethroids. Uh, Dr. Hale sent an email uh, to me the other day about this 10, I, these things are hard to say, it's 10 tranilipriol, the trade name for that is Tetrino, uh, that's more for lawn and turf. Uh, the spinosids, spinosids include spinosid and spinateram, uh, those are all general use. Uh, uh, they can be used and bought. Uh, in fact, Spinosad has the Entrust is actually an or, organic version. Uh, there's a bunch of trade names for Spinosad, and I listed some of those, Fertilome, Benide, Monterey, Ortho, all make uh, products that contain Spinosad, so you can get a hold of them. I know this is going on, but there's also some insect growth regulators like methoxyphenicide, which is intrepid. Uh, we've used quite a bit of that in soybean and pasture. It's also general use. Uh, I didn't look up diamond, but I think diamond or rhymin is restricted use, but it's another insect growth regulator. And then you have some of the old favorites like uh, uh, carbamate. Carbaryl is seven. Seven's been around forever, right? It's, it's general use. Uh, it's not used as often now, and I don't recommend it very often. It's, it's actually not very inexpensive either. Uh, you can also use orthene. Some of the orthene or acetate products are general use. And when I say orthene, don't be confused by ortho. Ortho is a brand that may have acetate in it or it may have something else in there. Uh, 
BT insecticides, the reason I scratch that through is uh, they're not going to work, in my opinion. They've never been effective on, on fall armyworm, and, and I wouldn't suggest using those. But you'll see some people have them on their recommended list. So I'm going to stop sharing. That went probably longer than I wanted to, but I wanted to open it up if there's any, any questions. I see some questions popping up on the, on the chat here, uh, but feel free to un unmic yourself. That was a lot of information, but I guess the good news is it's being recorded, <laughs> so you can kind of refer back to it, and uh, that'll be helpful. Uh, hey, Scott, okay. there was a, you had a question about fescue being attacked. Mitchell Mode is seeing quite a bit. In past years, I've seen fall armyworm on fescue also. And my experience has but, but been not, not so much, but I think, you know, it's kind of a sheer pressure thing. They definitely prefer things like Bermuda grass, but we've had such an outbreak this year. They're, they're not that picky all the time. Uh, it's interesting. A picture I have of a fall army worm that I use a lot is in fescue and has a real dark head and a real dark olive green color. Hardly mm -hmm. can see any stripes on it. So I don't know if yeah. that was the cotton version or what. I didn't realize they had those strains. Yeah, that cotton version tends to be brown in a very, very dark head. Uh, you know, almost greasy looking. They, they're, they're pretty easy to tell apart. So yeah, so, so they're obviously getting in some tall fescue. Yeah, broom sedge doesn't surprise me. Uh, I've seen some broom sedge weed, weeds out there. And I mean, the Bermuda is brown around them. There's some things they just won't eat. Uh, how about orchard grass? Has anybody seen them in orchard grass? Yeah, I, Chris, you just called. And so, uh, you know, I don't normally get a lot of calls about orchard grass, but you know, reality is they, they tend to be worse in ten, West Tennessee, and then they move east. And as you go east, you tend to run into more fescue and orchard grass. I don't think it's that common for you to run into them to high, in high populations. They just, they don't make it there. This year, they just got it their worst and earlier. There's a oh. question. There's a question <laughs> about fescue, whether it's killed or not. It's a different growth habit than your Bermuda grass. I would say you could have I don't know for sure, but I would think you might get more kill on something like fescue since it's a bunchy type growth. Anybody know? Have any history, any experience? I'll just speak up from what I've seen here at Murfreesboro around the county. It, it and again, it's odd that uh, I've seen a lot more damage on tall fescue yards than I have on Bermuda grass yards. I've got them in these turf plots we have here at Lane Agri Park, and you know Bermuda grass is just. 15 feet away and they haven't touched it but they really worked hard on the uh, the fescue but it looks like the fescue has been damaged pretty severely it's going to be interesting to see how much of it regrows but i have i have doubts <coughs> about good recovery on some of those just depending on how bad they've been uh, how bad they've been devastated by them be sure to take some good pictures i'd like to see if that comes out of it because with all the rain in the timing, you'd think that if the plant was, the crown wasn't killed, that it would recover. Yeah, and I, I know Chris Ramsey has a question or a comment, but I'll comment that he, not all Bermudas are created equal either. There's definitely preferences in those different varieties. And, and for whatever reason, I seem to see them worse when you get a little bit of a mix of something in there. There may be a little crabgrass, maybe a little clover in there. I think they like that. I think it gives them a little diversity and and uh, so sometimes just having a little something else in there is attractive to them. What about the endophytes that are sometimes found in some types of grasses? Do you think that has any effect on them? I, I don't know. I really don't. Chris, did you have a question or comment? Yeah. How are these moving from West Tennessee to East Tennessee? That's, that's a great question. Now, you've you got to keep in mind, they're native to South America and Mexico. And, and people would call them native here because they show up here every year. But they're migrating in. They may, in a warm winter, survive in South Florida, maybe on the coast. But probably, you know, Mexico, southern Texas is where they're actually coming in from. And then when I say they're migrating, that doesn't necessarily mean they're coming in one big flight. But they have a generation, the moths emerge, they can fly several hundred miles at least when they emerge, and then they start another generation. So they're literally just kind of leapfrogging 
and it's not all synchronous, right? Not all larvae are the same size at the same time. So it's probably taking them two or three generations to actually make it from Texas. When I first got my call from my buddy in College Station that said, man, they're really bad here. That was late June. And it you know, took them full two months to get here. That's at least two or three generations to get here. So uh, I think it was but, July 21st. I got my first report from West, Tech, West Tennessee. Yeah, they just, yeah, that, and that's a full month almost ahead of where we'd normally start seeing problems, but they're, they're trickling in. But a lot of these moths, you, you'd be impressed. They get up thousands of feet in the air and, and can fly miles and miles. They almost don't have to fly when they get that high. They get in those, those trade winds. Uh, and I don't know what it was this year that got them such an early start and, uh, and, and high numbers like that, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything we did here. It wasn't our way. Scott, we see the same thing with uh, with your black cutworms in April or so, and all of a sudden you don't have them. Some prevailing storms come up out of Texas or wherever, and all of a sudden they're all across the corn growing Midwest, in literally in just days. And yeah, these things will make it up into the upper Midwest. Uh, they're having big problems now in Southern Illinois and, and, and Missouri, but for them to cause economic problems farther north than that is really unusual. And this is kind of an aside, but it, they, it's pretty complicated. Those Appalachian Mountains make a difference. There's good data that shows a lot of our moth migration through that comes to Tennessee on the, on the west side actually comes from Texas and, and through Arkansas. When you get on the other side of the Appalachians, a lot of the moths, including fall armyworm and soybean loopers, tend to come up from Florida and, and all the way down into Puerto Rico. And that's one of the reasons those larvae are a little different. The ones that tend to show up in the Carolinas, for example, are, their insecticide resistance is much more like Puerto Rico, whereas ours tend to be more like, like Texas or, or Mexico. So. Uh, the mountains can be a bit of a barrier and kind of split your population uh, sources there. We did have a question in the chat about uh, the tall fescue and the lawn. Which of those products went through a lot of chemicals and stuff? Which of the products might we recommend in a home lawn and a fescue lawn? Dr. Hale, you may want to take that. Yeah, you know, I've got some slides I can go through here if you want right now, and we'll go through some of that. Sure. Sure, because we have some good extension publications and have that. While, while you're pulling, while you're pulling that up, we may have one more question for Dr. Stewart. To, okay. And more may come in. Um, somebody had sent in that they'd seen army worms, and they never come in from the middle of the field. You never notice them from the middle. They seem to come in from the sides. So would it be useful to make two or three laps around the outside of the field with a spray? He specifically mentions Intrepid. Uh, every every two or three weeks as a preventative, would would that be something to recommend? Well, I, I'm I'm a little skeptical, I guess. And a lot of times we do see them, like in soybean fields and things, are definitely worse on the edges. And part is they're being sourced from the ditches, the grasses in the ditches. When you start getting into a hay field, I don't think there's going to be as big an edge effect as as you think. I mean, these moths are flying miles they're not flying yards and I, I don't think there's a big impediment to flying another you know half mile into the field uh, there may be some things on that edges that are just a little more attractive to them maybe a different kind of grass so that might be some of the effect uh, it might in some case and they're they're weird guys they ate up my side yard I, I was in my, my wife embarrassed me I was she said do we have army worms I went out in my lush Bermuda grass in my front yard didn't see an army worm about four days later, she goes, that side yard's really brown. And I walked over there and there were, I, you couldn't take a step without stepping on 10 army worms. And there wasn't one in my front yard. And I, I don't know why that is. Afternoon shade in one spot, you know, so they, there's things we don't understand. Intrepid's a great product. I see the question about the availability issue. Yeah, that's a big problem. A lot of things are running out there. You know, they've been spraying these things, you know, for two months to the south and west of us. Uh, a lot of our product got shipped out of the state. People are trying to make more. Uh, there's a lot of things that are low. Uh, Arkansas, the big problem they had was with rice and, and not so much that that was their biggest problem, but rice is a very high valuable, high value crop and there's very little registered for it. They actually got a, a section 18 
for Intrepid, not Intrepid Edge. In, Intrepid's that insect growth regulator. It's got pretty good residual, good rain fastness. Uh, there are a couple of generics. Uh, Helena sells one called Troubadour. I know that, but supply has been very tight in part because of this Arkansas sucking up all the Intrepid for, for their rice. Uh, the question about whether we get, get, get a 24 uh, C label for Intrepid Edge, uh, I think is is very unlikely. Uh, I, I'll just be blunt, Tennessee sometimes difficult to work with on things like that, and they're definitely not quick to work with. They're very conservative on all their special local needs labels. Often they, they won't let you use them until the deadlines uh, are, are long past kind of deal. Uh, it might have been worth considering if we started, if we knew, I guess, six, eight weeks ago to see if we could do it. But I think it would be a several week process. And, and frankly, it's going to be over in, in two or three weeks if we get any kind of uh, cool September. Uh, Intrepid Edge, by the way, is a premix of Intrepid and Radiant. Radiant is at Spinosin. Uh, I'm not sure Radiant has, I, I didn't look at it. I don't think it has a label on, on any kind of forage or lawn. And if it doesn't, that's just a dead end. If it doesn't have that other component, doesn't have a label on forage and fodder and grass, there's no way they'll do it unless, unless the company pursues a lot of extra testing and research. It's a great question though. Question um, in terms of mode of action, I mean, um, or is this material absorbed through their skin or their, through the insect? How does it uh, control how it works? So, so py pyrethroids are strictly contact, which means if you spray them, they'll die. If they crawl through it, they should absorb it through their skin. If they eat it, that's kind of a form of contact. It's not what we'd call a gut poison, but it does expose the insect. The, the diamides are very similar. In fact, their mode of action isn't that different. Yeah, if, the, if they touch it, crawl through it, eat on it. Uh, and same with the spinosids. So a lot of them are pretty, these are contact. Now the exceptions, the, probably the big exception on the list I shared were the insect growth regulators. Those are all what we'd call stomach poisons. They have to be in, ingested. So the intrepid or the methoxyphenicide actually mimics juvenile, uh, make, make sure I get this right, Frank. It mimics juvenile hormone. It affects them when they molt and it messes up their multi. So it's actually a little slower acting because it really doesn't go into effect until they molt. Uh, the other one I mentioned, Nova Uron, which is the diamide, is a chitin synthesis inhibitor. It, it affects their chitin in their exoskeleton and, and it kills them. So they won't, they won't even affect the adults. They won't uh, kill an adult because adults don't molt. Uh, but all the other ones really are more or less contact mode of action. You, you know, they're going to either crawl through it or you, you hit them with a droplet. So for, yeah. for a home lawn that are granules, seems like those might be less effective than a liquid. Frank may want to comment, but a lot of times they'll tell you to sprinkle those in to kind of create a spray. Sure. Yeah, you're going to have to activate the granules with, with irrigation or rain. And when you do a spray, when you're spraying for a caterpillar, you want to spray it on the, on the grass and don't irrigate. You want to stay, keep it on there. So some of that residue, some of those granules get in the grass, and then when you get it wet, it kind of bleeds out on the, on the grass and stuff. And they're also crawling down through that thatch also, if you look at them. So they're going to come in contact with it. And of course, a heavy dew will activate a lot of that. You know how it is. Of course, now we're getting a lot of rain, but just a heavy dew in the morning and it'll kind of spread that material around. The granulars are probably more designed to get things like grubs and, and, and things, but I, I think they would work pretty well on, on these. They're, on they're the just time. convenient for homeowners too, because they don't always have a sprayer and they can put them out easy. Maybe. Dr. Hill, this might be more for you, but I had somebody ask me, um, if birds eat these worms that have maybe ingested or died from the insecticide, is there any concern about birds? I didn't know the answer. You know, we have had years ago, we had problems with organophosphate insecticides, uh, originally Dursban, and then it was can't use anymore in the landscape. 
then diazinon. You remember diazinon? And we used to get bird kills associated with using diazinon. They would eat earthworms and such that had come in contact. Uh, but I think for the most part, there's plenty of these caterpillars out there for the birds to feed on. And the chance are that you're going to get a, I've never really heard of an a issue with, with using the pyrethroids in these other products. And yeah, the, 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 yeah. The, the nice thing about really all these products, and one of the reasons a lot of them can be used by homeowners is they have pretty low mammalian toxicity. Now, birds aren't mammals, but most of them also have low uh, avian toxicity. Uh, the things like the spinosins, uh, the IGRs, especially the IGRs, they work on modes of action that only insects have, you know, or crustaceans, things that are arthropods, so that, you know, you could you and I could eat tablespoons full of them, and I wouldn't recommend that because they may be mixed with things that aren't good for you, but the active ingredient doesn't have any, any side of action on you. So uh, I, think, I think you're in pretty good shape, but one of the, I guess, advantages of these more expensive products, the diamides, the spinosins, the growth regulators, is they are very specific, so they're going to be the safest of the safe. I'll often recommend those people with horses on their pastures you know, they, they usually have the money to spend and they're pretty concerned about their horses. So you can lead them to the, the spinosins or the diamides that have essentially no mammalian toxicity and, and that eases their mind quite a bit. We have a few questions coming in in the chat. Martha had asked about uh, Weekly County, said she had 110 acres and hasn't noticed anything. So mainly has cattle and cuts hay and, and to me, we, we're, I think as agents, we're seeing some of that too, that some fields just aren't affected. Maybe some are affected and it's just not bad enough that the people are realizing, but it doesn't seem to be as widespread as this, if everybody. So Martha, it may just be that you're lucky and haven't been hit yet. <laughs> yeah, it, and it's just kind of like my side yard, front yard story. You know, I, I don't quite understand that, but we see it all the time. There's, there's, there can be huge differences. And the next guy down the road, I mean, we saw this with soybean, literally, a quarter mile down the road, couldn't tell a difference in one field is, is wrapped up and, and one isn't. There's probably an explanation. We're just not smart enough to, to figure it out. Uh, Sometimes but, around buildings, uh, Scott, we the moths are attracted to lights and we'll see a lot of eggs. We've seen a lot of eggs lay on porches and, and fence posts and things like that near buildings or that are kind of lit up. And, that, and then the eggs hatch and you see the damage closer to the building and then it moves out away from the building. So we see that quite a bit with, uh, in the home situation. Dr. Hale, I know you said you had a few slides. If you wanna pull those up, we'll let you. Okay, well, tell me if you can see it. I'm gonna share right now. Can you see that? We can, we see them. Okay. One thing about fall army worms or any kind of caterpillar, you want to try to control the early instars. And so what I recommend for landscape professionals and homeowners is to, uh, you probably heard somebody saying, using a little soap, a little dishwashing detergent, uh, you can actually sample. And the whole idea is to detect the first, second, and even third instar caterpillars. Control those before they do the damage. It's usually the later instars, those fourth and fifth instars, that really get big, that do this almost overnight damage. But they've been there as earlier instars, not doing as much damage. And then when they get full size, that's when the damage occurs. So a couple teaspoons of uh, liquid dishwashing detergent and a gallon of water, pour that over uh, four square foot of uh, turf grass or pasture. Uh, that's uh, two foot by two foot and wait about five, 10 minutes, and it will irritate the insects. They'll come crawling to the top. And I basically don't have a threshold for, for army worms. If you see them, you're gonna see a bunch of them. And if you have them, that's the time to treat because they have the ability to lay these egg masses and you can get a lot of caterpillars very quickly. So you wanna go after those early ones. Well, what if, what if you only have the bigger ones? Uh, then you're gonna to have to uh, treat them as soon as you can to prevent any more damage from occurring. If you look at that one on the right, uh, you see that little white egg laid on the back of it? 
I think it's a tachinid fly, a type of fly. It's a parasitoid. We'll lay eggs on them. I believe there's some hymenopterous parasitoids also. You'll, you'll also, look, also, it'll look like uh, little Q-tips, you know, little cotton balls in, in the grass. And you'll see these parasitoids are out there, but these insects lay so many eggs that they're not really going to control a big rip roaring infestation. But there is natural, natural control occurring. Here's just some pictures that I've been sent recently. You can see one yard has it and one has it. And I'm not sure what's going on there, if it has to do with different types of grasses or whatever. But uh, you can see that people will go away for a long weekend and come back and, and this is what they'll find. Uh, fortunately, these rains that we're gonna have hopefully will bring a lot of this turf grass back. But if it doesn't recover, the good thing is September's, somebody asked me today, what's the best time to get, you know, plant grass seed? And it's probably right now in August and September. I would wait till these guys are through because they really uh, like those tender young grasses. They do a lot of damage on those. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna emphasize that, Frank, because for years, anytime somebody's thrown out some Bermuda or fresh sod in, in August, it's very, very common. So you either need to watch close or be and be prepared to spray or just just don't do it. <laughs> but yeah, you might want to wait a little to see what happens if this slows down a little bit. And again, we were finding we we're getting pictures of uh you know, lots of these egg masses being laid on the underside of porches, on poles, usually vertical structures. This is at a golf course. And just look at all those egg masses. So they're laid somewhere, grass is maybe overhanging or over a field, edge of a field, and then they just drop down and, and those little caterpillars go to town. So once you start seeing this, then you know you're gonna have caterpillars pretty soon. What do the pupa look like? They're kind of a mahogany colored pupa and you'll see them right down in the thatch. And there's a picture on the right of, I believe, fescue. And there's one of those darker versions, Scott, that I've seen in past years of a fall army worm. We do have some nice publications. Uh, this was just updated last year by Dr. Vale and myself, lawn insects, how to control them. And this is focused towards the home homeowner that's putting out, uh, and that happens to be, a, I believe, a black cut worm there. But here's some of our recommendations. Um, I, I believe that one at the top is, uh, is that Grub X1, looks like it. And that's that same insecticide as in Celebrant. And again, you, it's uh, available to homeowners. You can put it out quite easily and you're not gonna have any problem getting this stuff activated with all the rain and bee bad. The, uh, you also will sometimes see combination products like the uh, BioAdvanced Imidacloprid plus uh, the, the uh, is it beta cyfluthrin, I believe. Yeah. And imidacloprid is really not going to help you much with caterpillars. It's just not effective on caterpillars. So the cyfluth, the pyrethroid is going to help you there. Uh, imidacloprid is good on other insects, sucking insects and white grubs and such, but it's not going to help you much there. Uh, but those combination products are available. Scott mentioned carbaryl and a pyrethroid. There's, a, there's the BioVance Complete Insect Killer. And it has both the pyrethroid and the carbamate. So that might be a good choice for these. Uh, you get a little bit of both. Um, the spinosad products, uh, we mentioned, uh, my, I, what was the product you mentioned? I know in ornamentals, we have Conserve SC, and then we have the Monterey Garden Insect Spray for homeowners that has spinosad in it. And again, one of the safer products to use in, your, in the landscape, if you're worried about safety of insecticides. And all, again, all these uh, home insecticides are, are, are more safe, you know, the safest things to use that we have out there. And some people might not wanna use insecticides and they would go with a, 
a nematode, but uh, I think that's a biological product like that. Maybe on a small infestation used early, you might get sufficient control, but once they're uh, doing a lot of damage, fourth or fifth instar, I don't think that'd probably be a real good choice. It would be too slow acting. Commercial, for commercial landscape managers, we have the commercial turf grass insect control. And if you look at the top, there's a PB number. And so you can go to our UT extension publications and find all these publications. We have uh, one section, just cut worms and army worms in general. And there are a lot of different products available there. You can see, of course, uh, there's band you would not use in you know, a landscape situation but you can use it in like on golf courses, places like that. Uh, as far as a, a celeprin, that, that came, comes as a granular or a, a SC formulation. And it says here, delay watering or mowing for 24 hours. Okay, if you wait, if the rains will stop that long and uh, allow that to be on there. And there's a product called Triple Crown that actually has has two types of pyrethroids, one at the bottom, and plus a metacloprid. So you'll get the activity of two pyrethroids. Also, we have products like Dilox, then pyrethroids like Tallstar and Tempo, and then the Spinosad pro uh, product, uh, Conserve SC. Okay. And, and some other products also uh, that you can see. We also have a little section just for fall army worms. And you can see here the triple crown, the celebrant, and for not for residential use, of course, Durzban or chlorpyrifos. And uh, they're basically getting rid of all the food uses for chlorpyrifos. You might have seen that lately. So. Uh, so that's one of those organophosphates. We have fewer and fewer of those products even around anymore, the carbamates and, and organophosphates, which tend to be more toxic, to, as Scott said, to mammals and other animals like that. And in addition to the recommendations would be that tetrino that uh, Scott mentioned earlier. We can, you can add that one to it. Here's just one to show you what the label looks like. It's uh, for pest infesting turf grass in and around residential, commercial, institutional buildings on golf courses and sports fields. And we've had some questions in the last week or so. We've had some sports fields that have been turned brown. You know, that doesn't look very good, does it? I guess you can spray it green, but uh, of its Bermuda. But this is a product that you would want to use, might want to use. And one of the advantages of using these acelaprin or tetrino is that uh, they, they, once they're applied, they, they last a while. Let's look at the caterpillars there. Apply when pest presence first observed. And then I, I believe uh, the application interval is a month. So that's basically you treat it once for a life cycle. Now, some of these products, pyrethroid, you might have to go out there or something else and hit it a couple of times. You might get not get the level of control this will give you with one. I know a celebrant, if you use it for white grub control at the higher rate, you can get several months of control of both white grubs, but also caterpillars, cutworms and army worms and sod web worms. So these products, uh, cost more, they're more expensive, but they're gonna give you longer lasting control and probably more, probably a higher level of control also. Spike. And I'll just I'll throw in here, you know, there is a, a, a kind of a safety net there too. And in terms of actual safety, you always get questions about people's pets. Most of these things have very short re-entry, but this product I think is four hours and trust me, there's a lot of safety margin on that. Uh, and I'm, I mentioned one of the good things about the, this product and this class, these diamides, is is rain fastness. One of the reasons they can last three or four weeks is they don't wash off. 
you know, you can you can waste an insecticide application if you spray in front of a one or two inch rain sometimes. Doc, but, let me ask you something. Do they have any systemic activity? Yeah, uh, they actually use this. The, I don't know about this particular one, but the chloran tranilipril. The sulfur. It, yeah, it's it's actually used in tomatoes as a uh, irrigation drench. Uh, so it kind of depends on the, the crop, how systemic they are. Uh, but we've definitely seen some impact even as seed treatments in some of our crops that'll last sometimes 60, 90 days on controlling caterpillars as a seed treatment and, and it varies on crops. So there's some interesting things that, that this class of chemistry does. I will tell you though, that we had some uh, Bermuda grass that was, was sprayed um, and then they cut it and then they ended up getting another infestation. So I think that, and that, <laughs> I think they cut away and harvested their, their treatment essentially you know, about a week later, and then they were reinfested. So they're not magic. Okay. Any, any questions about the home control? So you can refer your clients to a couple of those publications. And um, there, there was a question about whether homeowners could buy that to Trino. And I, I, I don't believe that's, that's not a restricted use, I don't think. I'll look it up while we're here. But Possibly, yeah, and you know, I, I really don't know a lot about it. It's really kind of learned about it recently. Uh, I'm sure it's very expensive. Okay. I'm sure I know commercial too. landscape people could use it, but they tend to use products that they're, they're more familiar with and, and they can get a little cheaper because they want to make a little more money. And yeah, so, so uh, yeah, there it is a not a federally restricted insecticide, so it's general use. Uh, you shouldn't need any kind of uh, card to buy it. Yeah, so I don't know if people know about it that much. It's a bare product. And so uh, maybe uh, it's uh, some still out there. Uh, so I'd look into it. It's, it's just the reality. I had a question uh, earlier, actually. It was who asked me the question about uh, using Corrigin. Corrigin is a version of the same active ingredient as Prevathon and, and the diamide that's used in things like fruits and vegetables and tobacco. And it actually has a label for forage and, and grasses. Uh, I can assure you that if you could buy the version that I would use in egg, in soybean or in cotton, it would be much, much cheaper. You all know that they charge a premium for these specialty crops. Uh, but if it's the only thing you get, it may be worth it, uh, you know, if it, if it saves the yard or saves the football field. Uh, but it, it would be labeled. But, uh, you know, he had a grower that I think it was a fruit and vegetable grower that was familiar with it and knew it worked great on caterpillars and, and, and really wanted to use it. And I was like, well, if you could get the other one, I, it's probably going to be half the price and it's the same active ingredient. And that's why all these things list them by active ingredient. And that's why I, I tried to go through that because there are just so many different formulations of of some of these things. Hey, Dr. Hale, I've got a question. Uh, sure, Mitchell. Uh, Alabama Cooperative Extension has got a pub controlling fall army worms on lawns and turf and on their uh, insecticide uh, uh, table for homeowners, they have listed there that bio-advanced 24-hour grub killer plus, that's a trichlorophone, or I think that's how you pronounce it. I know that's the same active ingredient as one you mentioned for the commercial applicators. Uh, would that be something that a homeowner might consider using uh, as well? What's the active ingredient? Trichlorophone. It's that uh, bio-advanced 24-hour grub killer plus. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it'd be like, um... Yeah, if they can find it, the same active ingredient there um, as a homeowner product, that'd be fine. You know, be like Dilox. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah I, have you had any experience be, with that product, Scott? I, I don't. I think that same publication Mitchell's referring to, they also recommended some of the BTs. I'll just caution you sometimes things are labeled that don't work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's BT is the first really thing on your list. list. Yeah, so I don't know much about that, but when I saw that in their list, I was like, well, maybe maybe that one works, maybe it doesn't. Yeah, but, I, I have Dilox in the uh, commercial turf grass for cutworms and army worms. 
So that, yeah, that's probably a good sign. But I, I can tell you, I've done a lot of work with BT products on the army worms in general, and none of them I've ever tested have been effective. And, yeah, and this, is a, this is organophosphate. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I just yeah, but the BTs. No, I wouldn't. And later instars BTs. You want to, again, if you're going to use a BT insecticide, you're going to have to hit the early instars when they're very tiny and they can't. De you know, they just do a better job. And mm -hmm. most insecticides that way. Yeah, but there, you know, there's some fit for the BT insecticides. Don't get me wrong, but fall armyworms just aren't particularly susceptible to them. Um, some of them. Some other caterpillars, you know, they work great on tomato hornworms if you get them when they're small. You know, there's some opportunities there, but I, I, I see that listed more than it should be sometimes on, on some of these critters. I used uh, bifenthrin on the, the, the plots here at Lane Agri Park, and I had the, <clears throat> I had the big ones. Uh, they were probably inch and a half long. I guess they were the final instar, and it did a good job on them. And, and I think that's, you know, considering the lack of supply of things, a lot of these pyrethroids are maybe all you can get readily. And, and the reviews have been very mixed from uh, nothing to very good. And that's been unique because normally the pyrethroids are good on this grass phase. I think it's obviously, I think mostly been a numbers game. And uh, maybe maybe not as good a you know if, if you have a bad application technique and you have a lot of numbers <laughs> that can be a problem. You know my buddy Gus said he goes well you know when you get eighty percent control of a hundred it looks pretty good. He said when you get eighty percent control of a million it doesn't look as good. And I think that's partly what's going on with with some of these uh, pyrethroid complaints is it's just been too big and maybe too late. Uh, yeah. Hey Scott, we had a question here. <clears throat> from somebody that has uh, some pastures and that they used uh, 7XLR and they had to move their cattle out for a couple weeks. What are some products you can use on pastures where you don't have to move the cattle? Yeah, there's actually quite a few. And if you go to our uh, that publication 1768, the very last section is pasture. And, and really the only ones that you have to move cattle out are seven and lanate, if I remember. Um, but all the pyrethroids have a zero day harvest grazing restriction. There may be a one day harvest restriction, but I mean, if you're within one day of harvest, harvest, you know, they won't eat dead grass. They're, they're, <laughs> so uh, the, the diamides that we talked about, uh, the Intrepid that we talked about, the IGRs, they all have no harvest restriction, grazing restriction. So they, they really are, are pretty good that way. Uh, again, that's that PB1768. You can find it on that utcrops.com website, but you can also find it, in the, uh, hopefully, in the extension publications. Uh, but uh, we, have, we have a lot of options there. I also see somebody ask, when is it too late to control army worms? I'm gonna tell you the biggest mistake people make is that oh they're about to cycle out. I can I can tell you they do about 90% of their feeding in the last two days of their life, and that's true with a lot of these caterpillars. So if it I mean unless they're just really on the way out and you're hardly seeing any, it's it's probably not too late because uh, that's just I've I've had a lot of that experience with a lot of things whether it's soybean loopers or fall armyworms. Oh well, let's wait wait three days they're going to be gone, but they literally with eat 90% of what they're gonna eat in those last two or three days of their life. That's why they sneak up on you because those first, second, third instars, you don't even really notice they're there. And then all of a sudden they hit that inch long worm and, and they, they start really chowing down. So I guess moving forward, I know Dr. Stewart, you said that September, hopefully we might have some cooler temperatures and, and get rid of these things. How cool does it need to be to, for people to kind of let their guard down and, and maybe moving forward, do we think this year was just an anomaly? You know, the one one out of 30 years and it's so bad or can we expect these moving forward or is it too soon to tell? Yeah, it, I, I, I think both, all those are great questions. Uh, you know, typically, honestly, a lot of times we're just starting to spray these things about this time of year. So we're gonna have another two, three weeks of warm weather, uh, more than likely, you know, we we're on our third round of them right now. There's no reason y'all aren't going to have round two. It, it does amaze me that they do seem to be pretty synchronized a lot of times. So you get a bunch of big larvae at the same time, and then you'll get about a 10-day reprieve. 
Uh, so, I, you know, if you think they're gone, you may need to go back and, and check again and, and keep watching for them. And Frank's soapy water techniques, a tried and true method of, of looking for them. Uh, just do a little better job of me. Don't forget your side yard, too. <laughs> You know, the good news is a lot of these grasses will come back and green back up, but you don't really want to go, you know, uh, into winter with a bunch of bear dirt. But, uh, you know, Bermuda is pretty hardy. Not all these grasses may re recover as well. I, I think it's an anomaly. Uh, you know, I mean, these things migrate up every year, and this is the, the year of the Army. Uh, you know, nobody I, I talk to, and, and Frank's been around a long time. Gus Lorenz, my colleague, older than I am, he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, I, I never, everybody's saying they've never seen anything like it, but, you know, we're going to have a winter and it's going to freeze them back and they're going to start next year. My best guess is next year there won't be hardly any because that tends to be how insect cycles work. You have a, a bunch and then diseases and pathogens and all these things knock them back. But, you know, it, it's just a guess. Uh, you know, if you're going to be a climate, you're going to talk about climate change and we're getting a little warmer. Well, if you believe that, then we're probably going to have a little more consistent problem with it because they're surviving the winter a little bit closer to us. You know.